when there's four people yelling at you like that, yep. two of them are jacked, one of them is a fucking hot ass exercise science student girl. No joke, man. Yeah. You get some dudes in there, there's a hot fucking grad student, these motherfuckers will try to kill themselves for that shit. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I like to think of myself as quite good looking. If I see myself trying hard in the mirror, I'm like, oh yeah? You want to impress yourself, Mike? It's a whole other thing. We have a whole lot of serial killer part of this channel. Folks, welcome. I'm Dr. Mike from Sounds Periodization. We have an awesome special guest today. This is Dr. Eric Helms. He is a competitive weightlifter, competitive powerlifter, competitive strongman athlete. Have you competed in a strongman before? I have. That makes one of us. Com a pro bodybuilder, pro natural bodybuilder, which is awesome, awesome, awesome. I'm also very close to getting my natty pro card in an alternate dream world. And Eric is one of the core top people for evidence-based information from a guy that isn't just a science nerd, even though he is, but he also lives the life, walks the walk, he trains almost daily. He is a bro in every sense of the word, except the part that confers low IQ and makes you say stupid things. Speaking of stupid things, it has been said many, many times that there is a limited ability to apply studies to the real world from, for bodybuilding purposes, which is totally valid. There are many reasons for this. Internal external validity, ecolo ecological validity, sample size, population, and they're all really good reasons. There is a reason, however, that people have stated it may or may not be a good reason, and we're here, Dr. Helms is gonna sort us out. And the reason is something like this. People say, look, the people in the training studies, recreationally trained undergraduates, most of them from the University of Uppsala in Sweden, if I know where that is, it's in Uppsala. It's in Sweden. Yes, and so um, these people don't, know how to train hard, they don't train hard. Thus, anytime you see a study that says XYZ will grow you XYZ if you go to failure, that's not real failure, that's pretend failure, they're nowhere near it. And even if it's an RIR study, it's like 10 RIR, because people in training studies don't go hard. They're not like us. And is it a valid view? Eric, tell us a story about all this. Well, first off, thanks for that introduction, Mike. And I would say that the only thing I'm actually competitive in is bodybuilding probably why I was able to get that pro card eventually. The rest I love, I have done, and we'll leave it there. Excellent. So thank uh, you for demeaning yourself. Please continue. That's how you start. That's how you <laughs> get people's trust. Oh, I always demean myself up front, especially with women. That's right. Um, so to answer your question most directly, I think the answer is essentially it's completely false. Okay. And it's very far that, from the truth. People in training studies actually train comparably hard to people in the real world. I was people who conduct training studies actually thought this through. So here's the thing. You have to think about who are the participants because they're not just people from the University of Uppsala. They are also people who decided that they want to participate in a research study. Usually they're not paid or paid very well. So they're very violent. They want to be there. Correct. They're science interested. They are also people who like to please the researcher. And that may not even be a character trait of them, but that is the social environment you're in when you join a study. You're given a participant information sheet that's normally absurdly long because you have to please the ethics committee. They love filling them out. They do. Uh, you're explained to it. You're given informed consent. You're walked through a familiarization session and then you start training and you're told what's gonna happen. And training is supervised. And you have typically at least one, if not a team of a mixture of undergraduate and graduate research assistants and, poten and potentially a postdoctor, you know, someone with a PhD or just a PhD student who is there because it is something fundamentally important to them as a researcher. They need to do it for their PhD, they need to do it for their career, and they are very careful to make sure that the methods go the way they're intended. So you have someone who's voluntarily decided to join a study and wants to please someone who is running a study who is very motivated to make sure that it is experimentally controlled in the way it should be. And what I think is happening in the comment sections or in the conversations you see where people assume that going to failure is just not happening, especially in untrained or recreationally trained participants, is they're basing it off their experience going to the gym. Mm -hmm. And I will concede that if you go to the average gym in most places and you just watch someone on a lap pull down, they're probably finishing around a six, seven RIR. Let me real quickly uh, add my two cents into that. Um, I think there is a population in the gym which absolutely does that and worse, 12 RAR. Sure. The person who's like doing arm curls like at this speed with no resistance for like an hour, are you spot reducing? 
but there are also very many regular ass people in the gym that every set ends in concentric failure and then some forced reps. That's also very common. So what I'm saying is it's absolutely true to say a lot of people in the gym don't go hard, yeah. but it's also true to say a lot of randos go hard as fuck. And like that also happens. So it's not even true to say that all people who are just starting in the gym or don't have an experience don't go hard. Dude, I've had beginners try to kill themselves in there. Sure. Sorry, please continue. And no, and you're right. There's actually been experimental research where they've taken people who are trained, re recreationally trained. and Two they, to three years of consistent training, three times a week-ish. Something plus. like that. that. That's a decent uh, average description of the literature. The specific study I'm thinking of was less than that. Okay, two years then? Or? I, I think it might have been even just six months or longer. Okay, okay. And the point is, is that they asked them, are you training for strength or hypertrophy? Um, and then yes. on bench press... Uh, what loads do you use for your 10 reps? And then they had them actually load that 10 rep load, not their 10 RM, but what they normally do 10 reps with in the gym. And then they had them go all the way to failure. After a warm up or no? They warmed them up. They brought Super. them through. Yeah. So, so they're really, an really ecologically, prepared. Yes. These people do their best. Yeah. They had an ecologically valid, motivated session, which is not what most people have in the gym unless they have a workout partner. And then they pushed them to failure. And you did get, to your point, a diversity of actual true what how many reps could I have done and there were a sizable number of people who were at good RIRs you know what I would say is zero two three very few people were actually going hitting failure on their tenth rep very few and there were maybe I think a third of them who were at a five RIR or greater mm -hmm. but one third is not even a majority it, it's a it's a sizable minority um, and there are maybe some contexts where that being your 10 rep load, if you're doing a high volume protocol or something like that, neck make maybe just fine. Um, but I would say that that is also not the same as a training study that is being conducted with a specific RIR or especially with the guidance to go to failure where it's being supervised and the people who are joining it are these people motivated to try to please the researchers. Now in research on failure, or comparing failure to non-failure groups, or actually just your typical resistance training study, they will typically define the loads they're using and the proximities to failure in one way or another. If they're actually having them train to failure, the ideal scenario is that they're reporting that as momentary muscular failure, mm -hmm. which is arguably the most objective definition of failure, where yes, you observe them attempting to complete a concentric rep and they fail to do so. Momentary muscular failure. I actually just prefer momentary failure because we don't actually know if it was muscular, which is a valid critique. But nonetheless, we are observing the person in the lab try to attempt a rep and they fail. Are they sandbagging though? Don't know. But you don't know for anyone. So exactly, back to the same one. you don't know whether that's in the gym or in the real world. But aren't gym guys ten years guys in guys on drugs? Aren't they tougher guys? Can't we assume that the other people are sandbagging? I mean, more frequently than not. Uh, maybe, but I don't think it's a fair comparison to say a high intensity trainer who goes to momentary muscular failure in bodybuilding is the comparison we must have in these studies sure. because that's actually not most of the people complaining about these studies not applying to them. You see this ubiquitously from people who quote unquote train hard. I've been a personal trainer for the very start of my career, then a strength conditioning coach, and now I'm a bodybuilding coach and I do seminars. I do train people in person occasionally in different settings academically. Um, and I've trained alongside weightlifters who go on the Olympics, powerlifters at the IPF world level. Um, I have trained alongside strongmen, like you've said, uh, and I've trained alongside many bodybuilders. And I can tell you that even in those communities, regularly training to failure, even when it's prescribed, is somewhat of a rarity. For real failure. For real failure. failure, like momentary mm -hmm. muscular failure. First, I'd say that's not necessarily always the ideal way to train. Well, that's for sure. Yeah. Our viewers will know that. Yeah, and when it is, it is something that even those athletes are asking, like, oh, I, that, that's why I have a workout partner. That's why you see in Pumping Iron, them training together. And, yeah, you know, know, right? So Arnold's standing behind him like, one more. Oh, God damn it, Arnold. You know, yeah. he has to do another rep. Yeah. Would he have done the rep if Arnold wasn't there? Maybe, maybe not. And these are Olympians. Yes. Right? So motivation and pushing to failure, I think, is something that everyone knows is challenging. Yeah. Um, but absolutely, in sporting populations, it's done consistently. But I would say even more consistently, it occurs in the lab. In the lab. Because session after session. You study have, after study. Yes. You have a defined criteria. If it's momentary muscular failure, you're going to observe that. 
And the, the occurrence of sandbagging is some unknown amount that I think is quite low based upon who's deciding to participate in the study. You can just see yourself out. You don't even have to show up. If they were paying tens of thousands a, a week for these studies, I could see people showing up and flubbing the failure, but like, there's, you have to be there. No, you would probably drop out sooner than you would just hurts, decide yeah. to fake it every time, yeah. you know? There are other definitions of failure. Sometimes people will report RMs, repetition maximums. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is kind of unclear of what's actually happening in the literature. Um, what typically is operationally really happening is they establish a 10 RM initially, which is typically like a 10 RPE. It's the most reps you could get at that load. You may have tried another one, maybe not, maybe it's just slow. Maybe the researcher decided, maybe you stopped. And then throughout the rest of the study, it says, and we maintain the 10 RM. What that really means is that at some point you were able to do more than 10 reps and they increased load mm -hmm. and they just didn't do a very good job of describing it. Mm -hmm. Ideally, they do describe this and you see a progression model, which means you're getting up to a 10 RPE, you're going down to a nine or eight, back up to a 10 RPE, mm -hmm. but you're always staying close enough to where they can see when you progress past the prescribed sure. load. Sure. So far, what we have, people who sign up for the studies are not randomly sampled. They want to be there and they've demonstrated that every day that they show back up. They're not getting paid, at least not much. The nominal amounts is a ton of their time. They're very interested. They signed up for it. Another thing we have is based on your personal experience, which is quite grand, you've actually traded with a bunch of people. And you're like, it would be a lie for me to say that strongmen and bodybuilders and powerlifters that are really trained harder than the people that I've seen go hard in studies you've observed, studies you've conducted. Also true so far? Correct. Now, I will say, if you were to remove the researchers from that equation... Yes. No, no, no. But, that but would why change. would we? Remember, the, the internally valid critique. These studies, guys don't go train hard. Yeah. The guy by himself without researchers, who gives a shit? We don't care because they never happen. To, to my, so that last thing I want to expand on one last point with you, Eric. I've been involved in training studies. We were instructed by the sheet in which you write out your methods to continue verbal reinforcement yeah. of certain kinds through the set, especially towards the end of the set. So you have some guy, Gary, he's lifting. He needs to get 10 reps. Come on, Gary. Let's go, Gary. Come on, Gary. Go, 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 in, go, 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 go. One more, one more. You got yeah. it. Good, good stuff. Like, when there's four people yelling at you like that, yep. two of them are jacked, one of them is a fucking hot ass exercise science student girl. No joke, man. Yeah. You get some dudes in there, there's a hot fucking grad student, these motherfuckers will try to kill themselves for that shit. We are. <laughs> I like to think of myself as quite good looking. If I see myself trying hard in the mirror, I'm like, oh yeah? You want to impress yourself, Mike? It's a whole other thing. We have a whole lot of serial killer part of this channel. In any case, can you speak to that? Yes. Is there like a crickets environment where people are like go to failure, Jim, and they all sit back and like very well? Or Absolutely is it like not. we're getting into it? Tell us about so that psychological. Since scale. the '80s, it's been established that verbal encouragement, the social environment, uh, external feedback—that's more recent. All of these things, music, all can improve acute strength or endurance performance. So. You know, if you hang out and you got your office and it happens to be next to the lab where they have an ergometer, you're going to hear, go, 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 nice job. Ten people screaming at the same time. Go, 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 nice job. You know, it's this constant thing and you have typically multiple people and you're going to have an abundance of spotters because, again, ethics. So they're quite close to you, actually. Yeah. And there's a study showing that spotting improves strength performance. Makes sense. You're you feel more liberated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're more likely to go for the rep that yes. you're unsure that you can yes. get. You're but safe. there's also another human there with a social expectation of you trying. Correct. It's weird not to try when people are there like, all right, try your best. There's six grad students. You're like, yeah, fuck these people. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard not to try yes. when you have a room full of positive people who are motivating you to do it. You signed up to be in that room. Correct. So based on all of this and based on your perception, you're comfortable saying that at the very least, I don't want to put words in your mouth, at the very least, the supposition that people in studies don't train as hard as real people in the real world is unfounded. And maybe at best, it's actually just you would bet money it's not true. Where do you stand between those two? The places where I'm most confident that the training is as hard as what is described in the methods is in research papers. And if that research paper, I'm being very specific here, is one where the training would look hard on paper, it's harder than what's being done in the real world on average. Now you, you can, don't have a team of five undergrads yelling at you everywhere. Exactly. You're now, I'm trying to arrange for that. Yeah. Now, now you could set up a study when you compare a failure group to a non-failure group where they're doing uh, 10 by 5 with their 10 RM. You know, so they're intentionally stopping at what is roughly a 5 RIR. And that would be 
semi hard, but not that hard, right? No one's claiming that that's hard training. Correct. Those are studies designed to train how hard, designed to test how hard do we need to train to get the results that we want. Yes. Yes. Okay. So when studies that claim they're going hard, they're, they're going, going hard. fucking hard. Yes. For real, for real. Absolutely. And some of the protocols are downright brutal, you know? Oh my God. There's a reason I don't do training studies myself. I'm like, I would die at set number seven. Yeah. There is some BFR research that, uh, shout out to my buddy Omar, for, for fun, he decided to show how hard it was, and it was sets to failure on BFR front squats. That's a cruel joke. Yeah. He, he, he basically collapsed, you know? Um, there are studies where they're comparing low load to high load training, where, for example, out of Brad Schoenfeld's lab, 25 to 35 RMs on leg press. People yelling at you. Yeah. And That's you know, so terrible. We do that on the RP channel to yeah. voluntary bodybuilders. In in one of uh, those manuscripts, I was reading the discussion, and they noted, and of course, eloquent, you know, scientific writing that uh, this may not be ecologically feasible due to the number of vomiting occurrences in the yes, low load group. Yes, it's so feasible. There's a trash can in your gym, motherfucker. Yeah, there you go. I love it. So, uh, basically, when hard training is experimentally tested, it's hard. Period. When people say they do hard training, and I meet them in the wild. Maybe. I go, maybe. maybe. I need to see it, though. And it doesn't matter if they're 30 pounds heavier than me and have an IPB Pro card. 100% honest. Well, why would it? I know a lot of those guys, they train like fucking, you know, insert uh, outdated uh, gender-based insult here. <laughs> you like that? That's how we I do, do. That, eh? you, you You manage to say it without saying it. Yes. Which, that's saying something. That's saying something. Without saying something. Unbelievable. That's the best note we can possibly finish on, guys. Follow Mr. Eric, Dr. Eric's my God. Um, see, I'm used to saying Mr. Nick Shaw, my boss, and it beats me if I get that wrong. Uh, Dr. Eric Helms is a researcher in New Zealand of all the stuff. He also looks exactly and is Captain America. He is on 3DMJ, which has an unbelievable vault of, I don't know, a trillion in-depth whole courses on YouTube. You can sign up for that. There's a crap load of free YouTube stuff you can get from these guys. They have awesome websites, awesome social media. You have published, I've lost track of how many books you have out. Books, Google Eric Helms, find his shit. You are gonna have an explosion of science-based influence, ideally in the area of your mouth. What? That last part's nonsense. See you guys next time.